And so instead of focusing my design energy on buildings, I was really thinking about how the <clears throat> hard infrastructures, the built stuff like trucks or cold storage or kitchens, the hard infrastructure food systems and the soft infrastructure like policies and funding mechanisms and social relationships, that soft infrastructure work together to create food systems that work for people and communities. <clears throat> and a big pivot for me was <clears throat> when I started to notice things like this. Um, <clears throat> so food deserts, I think many of you are probably familiar with the idea of a food desert, but typically um, a low income area of a city or rural area, um, typically, but not always, at least in cities, um, with a high proportion of uh, people of color. <clears throat> and so in food deserts, where you have this intersection of um, kind of social disadvantage, um, you often have low food access. And this can be the kind of place um, this corner store in Durham, it can be the kind of place that's really the only easy place for you to get food. And the food options here are super limited and really unhealthy and um, are one more way that <clears throat> sort of we as Americans like to build inequity into our system. We create these sort of formal and informal policies that actually build um, <clears throat> discrimination against low income communities and communities of color. And I started to see this as an urban problem. So it's a planning problem, it's a spatial problem, an architectural problem, but also started to really realize the health and social and economic problems that this both results from and also exacerbates. <clears throat> so I built my master, my final project uh, in my master's degree looking at this part of Durham. So the orange are streets and the gray are houses. The green are all vacant lots. This is part of Northeast Central Durham. And I started to study how the food system exists in this neighborhood. <clears throat> and then started to think about where the opportunities might be to intervene and to create different kinds of food access or food um, sort of opportunities or places for communities to start sort of building some self-determination about what they would want in certain places. So how to think about space and community programming and open-endedness, knowing that it's one thing to study the space and sort of the movement patterns in a neighborhood. It's a totally different thing to actually allow the community to come together and define in an emergent way what works for them. And so this was sort of the first step towards that for me, really looking at, <clears throat> at how food works in a neighborhood. And so I came up with some ideas like this, like how do you repurpose old buildings to do lots of things around food and engagement and economic opportunity, really kind of informal pop-up opportunities. <clears throat> And really thinking about how behind all these things, many Americans, certainly many people here in the triangle, experience this as the face of the food system, um, that we take for granted this abundance uh, that we often find in a grocery store, when really there are lots and lots of things behind it, this whole food system that is behind all of that, food system with lots of different geographies and economies um, and communities behind it that we don't see typically unless we really start digging into it. <clears throat> and as I started to study food more and more and sort of finishing up my master's project, moving out into the world and finding some early opportunities to do food projects, um, this is a quote that I kept coming back to. <clears throat> and Basically, it says that food connects everything. If you design using food or food systems as your starting point, then you actually create good communities, sustainable, workable communities. So food actually becomes this sort of multi-connected sort of framework that touches all the other parts of our community. And this quote gave me permission to actually move away from architecture and become a food system designer. And when I did that, I realized that I needed to make a company to do that, um, that I needed to create a brand, I needed to create the structure of a business, 
And these are all the things that I wanted to work on. <clears throat> I wanted to work within the food system, but these were the things that really stuck out to me as core issues um, that I wanted to have the opportunity to be part of. And these are all like big, wicked problems, right? But they all link back through food. <clears throat> and the food system here, kind of a simplified version, where there's some activities um, and relationships within production, and then food typically moves through into processing and distribution, sort of back and forth there. And finally, when we get it, and then when food food waste either gets thrown away or gets composted or gets transformed into other useful things like animal feed or biofuels. Um, but looking at this as a cycle became the, <clears throat> the whole territory within which my company would operate. I didn't wanna be limited to one or the other of these areas because for me, it is a system. And so if you could create an effective small food processing company, you needed to know what it's upstream, kind of moving from processing to production and downstream distribution, consumption and food waste, what its upstream and downstream opportunities were to move these values forward. So if you had a small food processing company, how does that become an a vehicle to solve social injustice or a way to preserve more farmland? So, so for me, this system becomes a very, very important way to think about what my impact could be as a company. And I wanted to approach problems through a human-centered design lens. And so instead of thinking about a small food processing company that, you know, looked to local farms and maybe wanted to package things in a really sustainable way, I also wanted to ask, how does it matter for people? How will whatever we're working on, whether it's a small food processing company or an urban farm project or a food security plan, how will that project affect human beings? And so about the human centered design solutions, really thinking about the human experience and the community experience as the commonality between all of your design work um, was also a way that we wanted to go. So all those things, the values and the issues in the food system, looking at the whole food system as the design territory, and then using design thinking and human-centered design as the sort of method, um, was, it was possible for me to bring that together because I really wanted to create the opportunity to make change. I didn't necessarily think, I didn't have enough uh, self-confidence that I was going to go out and like make the change, but I wanted to make the opportunity to do that. And I think coming out of a design program, I'd been working a lot on creativity. And so it gave me the confidence to create a company using what I knew it needed to be without feeling myself limited to what I'd seen before. I'd never seen a food system design company before, but I think that I was able to believe in my vision of what this firm might be and was able to create it. And we've been able to work on a lot of really great projects since then. Um, and hopefully it's been a, sort of has resulted in change for the better. And so this company I created would be nimble and versatile, be able to work in the whole food system at all different scales. Um, and we could jump in in a lot of different roles. We could wear different hats. We could be a consultant. We could be an advocate for community issues. Um, or sort of local governance issues. We could be a research team or we could be a project initiator. We didn't always have to wait around for a client to put a project brief out there and try to find somebody to answer it. I wanted to also be able to invent new projects ourselves. Um, and, you know, again, I wanted to create a change-making platform where my passions about better local food systems, better food systems, um, where I could create a platform for that. And I also wanted to create that platform in such a way that it was open and welcoming and hopefully inspiring so that diverse talent would just be attracted to, to see what we're up to and see if they could join in. And so far, sort of knock on wood, um, have been super lucky in the last you know, eight or nine years, 
I've been super fortunate to have amazing people. Well, fortunately, not all at once um, because we're pretty small. Um, but I've been really lucky to have some amazing people uh, email me or uh, walk through the door. And timing generally works out. And I've been able to keep a really great team of people that's changed over the seasons. Um, but I think that because I have a platform that reflects the passion I have for this work, I think that makes it easier for um, talented people to see themselves getting inspired and making a contribution. And so Community Food Lab is what I invented in like formally uh, launched it in 2013. Um, and it's a for-profit company with a mission. And the mission here is in orange, and this is just the front page of our website. Um, my mission is to create change in communities by connecting people, design thinking, and intelligent food system planning. Um, the people is super important through community engagement, through outreach, through just kind of a human-centered framework on all of this. Um, design thinking is important because design thinking assumes that you don't have all the answers. And that was really important to me not to be a food system expert, but to be almost sort of food systems aware, but knowing that I don't know everything, knowing that we as a team would never know anything. So design thinking helps you uncover the questions that you didn't know were there before. And then intelligent food systems planning. How do you deliver something that a local government or a nonprofit would really find valuable so that they can then take the next steps in constructing the shared community kitchen or building out their community garden program with a really energetic energetic sort of participation. Um, and so the people that we work with need really good strategies and really good plans so that they can move their work forward. <clears throat> so Community Food Lab is the for-profit mission-based shell that I set up. And when I don't think about it, it feels like a business. Um, when I do think about it, it's a social enterprise. Um, it's a business that I set up <clears throat> to allow social impact, to allow me and the team to make an impact on social issues using business as the engine to allow us to do that. So um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more, but I wanted to take a step back and talk about social enterprise. Um, so this is a this is a chart that I, I found on the internet just last week. Um, Nicole Motter has a really, really great article on sort of the six types of social enterprises. I thought it'd be really valuable for this conversation. Um, and so she sort of breaks the idea of social enterprise out from a single monolithic idea of using business for social good. <clears throat> and she gets into a little bit more deeply. Um, so, so starting off with type one, um, it's just a nonprofit, an entrepreneurial nonprofit. So not just a nonprofit that raises money through philanthropic donations and then does their service, but <clears throat> Um, a good clear classic example of this would be <clears throat> a classic example would be the Girl Scout cookies. Um, Girl Scouts sell cookies at market rate. So there, it's a business activity and they use the proceeds from those cookies to fund the Girl Scouts, which is a nonprofit. So uh, business activity to support nonprofit programs. <clears throat> so that's sort of the number one. The non-nonprofit is <clears throat> a company that's actually structured as a for-profit. So Community Food Lab is an LLC, but they do lots of things the way a nonprofit does. <clears throat> um, you know, working in partnerships, building collaborative networks, um, sometimes doing work that doesn't pay any money, um, adding knowledge and uh, adding knowledge to conversations or doing convenings, things like that. Things that nonprofits typically do, but doing it from a for-profit platform. So I think Community Food Lab is um, maybe a pretty good example of that. The third one would be a socially responsible business. So this is a business that just has a core model of 
selling a product or a service. Um, like, like Patagonia is a great example where Patagonia sells clothes and, you know, some other things, but mostly they sell clothes, but throughout their entire decision flow, they try to make decisions that <clears throat> are good for a triple bottom line. How do they source materials? Um, how do they support their employees? Where do they locate their factories? Um, what do they do with waste on the other end of things? Um, how they use their profits? Do some of those profits get rolled back into their important causes? And so, so three would be a socially responsible business. And this is a social enterprise, right? Um, it looks a lot like a business, but it really kind of does good things for society. Um, the, the mission around it can be a little bit fuzzy sometimes, but um, I think it's an, an important model. The next one, four, give one, get one, and donate the proceeds. Um, Tom's Shoes is a great example. So basically, it's a business that sells shoes, but, you know, they donate a portion of every sale, in Tom's case, to give a pair of shoes um, to people that otherwise might have a tough time buying new shoes. Um, so Tom's serve as a model that give one, get one. <clears throat> and then a conscious company or conscious brand or lifestyle brand. Um, some might be called an awareness brand. <clears throat> um, and this would be a company that, you know, maybe a fashion company that markets its stuff by raising awareness around core social issues. So, um, you know, it could be a fashion company that really builds itself around, let's say, LGBTQ issues. And so it creates fashion and sometimes sort of statement clothing or other things that helps build awareness. And so it sort of helps grow its own business through that awareness channel and then is able to use its profits to help further grow that awareness of that issue. And so so that's kind of a, another sort of aspect of social entrepreneurship. Um, for us, like where does Community Food Lab fit into that spectrum? Um, you know, we use business tools. We work mostly for clients um, and we work under contract and so the clients pay us fees um, to do things like a food security plan or um, you know, kind of a parks plan with community gardens and food forests mixed into it um, to help design a food pantry in a hospital. <clears throat> um, so clients pay us to do work and we were able to use that income to help fund things like research, um, advocacy, pro bono work. Um, so examples of our client work, again, would be like helping design a big like 60 acre agricultural education center in Caswell County with a community college there. Um, in Strathcona, Strathcona County, which is outside of Edmonton in Canada, uh, we developed an urban agriculture plan for the um, for the city, um, helped develop an educational farm for Durham Public School System, and we did a food pantry for UNC Rex. And those are that's all client-based work. And so we're able to make a difference, but it's really making a difference through that client's vision. And then that helps pay for things like research, advocacy, pro bono work. Um, and these are things that we're able to initiate on our own or partner up with people who really are trying to push things in new, really impactful, significant ways. Um, we did a, a couple of booklets called Open Food that helped educate people around urban agriculture. Um, and we just sort of invented and published those ourselves through a Kickstarter. Um, we did a research project last summer um, and Mara Lowry, who works with us, um, did a presentation on that for this uh, for this symposium, I think it's up on the website, a research project on farmers markets and how they're dealing with COVID um, and equity issues. Um, and then we spent a few months last summer working on a project in Kitengela, Kenya, um, an agricultural education center there uh, with, um, with a Kenyan who's now spending half his time in North Carolina. Um, and we wanted to donate our time for that project because he's doing very, very mission-based work. It's very lean, doesn't have a whole lot of money to spend, and we totally believe in his vision and wanted to contribute to that. So our client-based work helps give us the financial ability to do all of that. And so in this spectrum, I think that mostly puts us in the non-nonprofit. Like we do things that nonprofits do, like research or um, <clears throat> kind of pro bono design work. Um, but we also use sort of the, 
a little bit kind of the give one, get one, like a portion of our proceeds helps fund internally um, that kind of nonprofit-ish work. So I think we're mostly number two on here, um, but you know, maybe you lead into number four a little bit. <clears throat> and so that's, um, and hopefully um, any questions you have, you can add to the chat and we'll definitely make time to come back around to them. Um, I wanted now just to kind of show a few um, kind of recent NC, not all NC State, but a few recent grads and how they've created social enterprises, um, all that all relate to food in one way or another, um, as ways to give sort of examples of that. And then I'll run through sort of some lessons learned on my end over like what it means to start a business like this. Um, and then we'll get into questions. So hopefully it's been hopefully it's been good so far. Um, and I'm happy always to talk about other, you know, in more depth as things come up. So um, I've so I've been out of school a while. I was out of school a while after my undergrad before coming back and getting my master's degree. Um, and I love being in school. Um, and I think that this idea is sort of what I saw as the opposite of being in school. I always saw being in school as opening the doors wide to possibilities um, and getting inspired by conversations and classes and, um, you know, all the all the things that happen in a community. I know now virtually it's much more difficult, but um, my hope is that it's still there. And so thinking back to being in school you know as a place to kind of start the seeds of some sort of like a social enterprise like seeing a problem recognizing that no one else is really working on it in the way that you envision and so what does it look like to sort of move into that space and solve a problem and i wanted to throw this quote up because this quote talks about the opposite of that um that a lot of our culture and a lot of the reward system in our economy <clears throat> is about specialization. Um, it goes to the root of the industrial revolution. Um, it talks to a lot of the industries and professions we have now. And it's not inherently bad, but like anything else, there are good and bad things about it. And one of the things about special, the specialist system and the specialists is that you are trained to look at things in one way and trained to do things one way. <clears throat> and I feel that if you see the complexity of the world and are drawn to help solve the urgent challenges with, within that complexity, the urgent challenges in our communities, in our society, at whatever level, whether it's in your neighborhood, or in all of Eastern North, all of Eastern United States, or globally. If you see things that way, then you must beware the specialist system. You have to keep yourself in a little bit of a generalist mode so that you can navigate that complexity. You can learn to be comfortable with ambiguity and you can learn to let your ideas evolve as you get more information, as you test them. Um, <clears throat> and that's a really crucial thing um, for anyone who's going to start something. <clears throat> Cecilia started something. Um, Cecilia uh, Polanco went to Carolina um, and uh, started I think while she was still in school, maybe a little bit afterwards, started a food truck called So Good Pupusas. Um, and it was super successful. She did great. It was mostly based in Durham. Um, but she partnered it soon after starting it with Pupusas for Education. And so <clears throat> she made Pupusas, food from her native El Salvador, and sold them. And the proceeds from that funded a nonprofit. So the food truck was a for-profit coupled with a nonprofit business. Um, and they had a very clear association and relationship. And the Pupusas for Education helped support scholarships for underserved communities of color, especially uh, 
Latina, Latino communities. Um, so for me, like very creative, um, committed, and had a real vision about what she wanted to do. Um, another, not so recent now, another grad, uh, Shraddha Rathad, um, really came through computer science, but also recognized the kind of ineffectiveness of much of the sort of local food economy, um, that it was hard for farmers to find customers. You know, aside from like, going to a farmer's market um, or you know, even setting up a CSA, both things that took a lot of time, um, <clears throat> it was really ineffective for farmers to find restaurant clients, wholesale clients, other kinds of clients because the marketplace wasn't well established. And so she created a company called Fresh Fire, I'm sorry, Fresh Fire, um, that provides a virtual marketplace for farmers and food buyers um, to really make more effective economic opportunities for small farmers. <clears throat> um, and so you can see here, this is from their website, you know, they work to give the buyers and the vendors a fair voice in the food value chain. So building transparency, building better connectivity, um, and building more opportunity for engaging in those, um, in those systems. And then the last person I wanted to introduce is Maggie Kane, um, who, uh, if you know her, you know how awesome she is. Um, and I think she is the founder, but I think now a place at the table is really a, a community. Um, a place at the table is a pay what you can restaurant. It's located in downtown Raleigh which means that anybody that goes in can get a meal regardless of whether they can pay or not. Um, many people uh, go and buy a meal at regular price. Many people pay a meal forward also. Uh, many people volunteer there. But they're also, I think when you're sitting there, I think just as many people who aren't able to pay the, pay sort of the listed price or aren't able to pay anything at all. Um, and those folks uh, are able to volunteer to help offset the cost of that meal, or they're just giving it for free if they just need a meal. Um, it's really designed to be a place where everyone is welcome. Um, they put, they've <clears throat> developed a personality around how they greet people and how they build a spirit in their space. <clears throat> um, and it's remarkable. It's a nonprofit pay what you can cafe. Um, that again, it's a, it's a social enterprise. They're selling food in order to give food away. <clears throat> um, but back to the like specialization question and sort of how these folks started, I think it's really important when you see something awesome in the world, not to assume that it was always that way. Um, I think each of these women <clears throat> um, kind of evolved their ideas over time, pretty intensively, some of them, through incubator programs, through accelerator programs, business plan competitions, um, you know, the opportunities for fellowships, um, sometimes through some grants, <clears throat> lots and lots of mentorship. Um, and these ideas, I think, evolved as they, <clears throat> as they went forward um, to the point where um, you know, I think any one of them looking back, and I've talked with all of them about the work they do, um, where any one of them looking back would say that what they're doing now or sort of where things sort of have landed now is both not the end point, but it's also nowhere close to what they imagined when they first started. Um, and so they've, they've had to learn lots of new things. They've had to throw away what they thought were their best ideas ever. Um, and that's typical. And I think trying to be a specialist can get in the way of that sometimes. So keep your mind open when you can. Embrace not only other ideas, but whole other disciplines and whole other ways of doing it um, to really sort of help open up what your opportunities are um, in, in the work that we're talking about. And so, you know, in, you know, I think, yeah, so... Um, if food justice is the kind of is the topic, then complexity is naturally part of the conversation. Um, 
food justice is such a is such a complicated issue. Um, could talk about the actual day to day experience of being hungry. You could talk about the neighborhood experience of <clears throat> sort of having sort of food desert opportunities only of being sort of geographically excluded from sort of healthy food options. Um, you could talk about um, school food programs and how many of them are nutritionally really lacking and how that disproportionately affects lower income communities. Um, you could talk about root cause stuff, about sort of economics <clears throat> um, and language and education. There's so many parts to food justice um, that really sort of keeping an open mind to hear other perspectives and first person experiences and letting that start to guide you and sort of guide your approaches is super important. Um, so I think that the, the, the examples of the three social entrepreneurs that I showed, I think all hopefully sort of show that, that there's, a, there's a pathway and there's sort of a journey that I don't think is, um, necessarily ever done and it certainly hasn't been for me um, so <clears throat> I think that's that's kind of a big a big lesson is um, to focus on what is what's important right the kind of the big issues or the values that you hold and then and then be willing to sort of dig and explore and test things and try things um, things that you know, if you're thinking about going down this road and getting started, um, things that I think I learned um, and looking back have been super important. Uh, one is like super practical. It's like have a workspace. <laughs> um, I was able to just rent a desk in a shared in a shared workspace in Boylan Heights, and having that home base, there was a place where I could go out of the house. Um, and really kind of focus and give it space was really important. And at the time, I don't think I recognized that. But if you're going to do something and make something, you have to invest in the space to, to be with it, I think. Um, and then another, I think, big one to keep in mind is that none of it is done alone. Um, and the, the one thing... So I think two two parts to this. One is that I've been really fortunate to have um, great collaborators and great mentors and great teammates. Um, <clears throat> and I think that probably anybody doing this work would say the same thing. So surround yourself with folks like that and make a habit of reaching out to talk to people if you um, want to learn more about what they're doing or have ideas to share or people that you know a little bit better who can actually give you directed feedback on what you're talking about and what you're thinking about. So find collaborators and mentors everywhere you can. Um, the big gap, I think, for me where I where Community Food Lab is and sort of how it started um, is that I'm the only founder. I'm the owner. Um, and that makes it easy to get started. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. You don't have to build consensus around anything. You can move a little bit faster. Um, but it's not as good. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't know necessarily what the answer for me is on that. I think that it's not the end of the world. Um, but I think starting something new um, is better if you don't necessarily start it alone, I think finding like-minded folks who are willing to go in with you and take some risk and invent something new in the world is important. Um, and man, it's funny, like thinking back on it, I hadn't thought about this for a while, but when I was thinking about all the ideas that became Community Food Lab, I actually spent about four or five months working with two other people. One was kind of an urban agriculture, pretty radical, like urban agriculture educator and advocate. Another, the other one sort of came from a sort of a sustainable business background. And the three of us got together and we worked for probably four months on trying to create a business framework that would allow us to 
sort of redesign the food system. Um, they would allow us to do projects, fundraise, um, move things in the direction that we were thinking about. And it didn't, it never quite gelled. It never quite clicked together. And not long after we, um, you know, sort of threw up our hands on that, like I had done a lot of thinking by that point. I knew what it wanted to look like. So I started Community Food Lab um, not long after. Um, and part of me wishes it had been a collaborative thing, but um, part of me also kind of knows that at that point I would have been pretty impatient to um, try to go back through the process of building something together. But all things being equal, um, collaboration would have, I think would have been a valuable thing. Um, and then I think the other, the other thing to just to share is that Community Food Lab was started intentionally as a for-profit. I spent a lot of time thinking about what a nonprofit structure might offer. Um, and I don't know that there's a right answer um, to this. I still don't know if I made the right choice, but a for-profit is generally much easier to start. There's less paperwork. Um, there's less things to file. Uh, the taxes are really easy um, or relatively easy. And so an LLC is just an easier way to get up and running with the business. Um, <clears throat> a nonprofit would give us much easier access to grant money, um, to kind of foundation support, to do all the like pro bono and research stuff that, that we've done. Um, and so, and, and being a nonprofit uh, would also, I think, change our brand a little bit. Um, I think there are times when being a for-profit um, sort of produces some skepticism. Um, if we're in a community conversation and we're working with community leaders and we're, then we're sort of talking about how we have done sort of planning and we've been able to do strategy before, things like that. Um, there are sometimes moments where um, the air goes out of the conversation a little bit when someone realizes that we're a for-profit. And then we have to take a step back and sort of explain how we are as a business, um, how our sort of mission aligns with our sort of business practices. Um, but if we were straight up nonprofit, I think that moment of sort of skepticism or, you know, kind of mistrust. I mean, you can imagine people who are dedicate their lives to a neighborhood, um, make all kinds of sacrifices in order to really be part of a community and to do important work um, to move those community issues forward. Um, initially, I think, and, you know, understandably see a for-profit coming in as, um, as something to be skeptical of. And so sometimes that um, has slowed conversations down. Um, but, you know, I think there's pros and cons for everything. Um, and, um, you know, there definitely are days and there's a, you know, there's a couple months last summer where um, we spent a lot of time exploring what shifting to a nonprofit would be. And it's not off the table yet, um, but it's, it's a lot to think about kind of making sort of a shift in the business structure that way. Um, so those are just kind of some initial um, lessons kind of along the way for us. Um, and then I just ended with this, um, that kind of moving forward would be, um, I think the next thing for all of us to think about for me, um, even in reflecting on a presentation like this one, there's a lot of value in, in that self-reflection, like where we, where have we come? What have we achieved so far? Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully, uh, for each of you, there's a sense too that in exploring ideas of food justice, um, in exploring, you know, it's big, your ideas like intersecting, intersecting issues and topics that um, you see yourself sort of in a, sort of in a forward um, mode also. So I'll just leave you with that, and um, I think we'll stop sharing the screen. And I guess see if there are any questions. Thank you guys for being patient um, through all of that. 
Um, I appreciate it. Um, so I think LP, I'll just, if I see questions in the chat uh, to everyone, I'll just answer them. Um, if there's anything else, just, I don't know, point them my way. <laughs> um, um, so this first question, um, student internship positions, uh, volunteer positions, um, Oh, thank you for the thank you for the kind words about the presentation. Um, um, we currently don't have any student internship positions, um, and volunteer positions we don't have right now. We um, were pretty busy a year ago, um, and I was telling I was telling Gracelyn and LP before the presentation. Kumi Food Lab was pretty busy a year ago, and um, with the pandemic, a number of things slowed down. Um, and so it's been a little bit slower for us this year. Right now, Community Food Lab is myself and Mara Lowry, who has also presented the symposium. Um, a year ago, there were three and a half people in Community Food Lab, and now it's just two. Um, I'm hoping that some more things come in, um, but right now we don't have any openings like that. Um, I do know that um, from a volunteer standpoint, the Capital Area Food Network would be worth looking at and trying to get to know. Um, <clears throat> and they're based here in Raleigh and do work throughout Wake County. Um, and, you know, if you have more specific questions about any of that stuff, um, feel free to email me. I'm always, you know, try, try to answer emails and um, could tr help point you to things that are more aligned with your interests, um, if I could. I actually have a question. I'm curious, like what challenges or maybe even failures you faced either working with clients or like even getting your business functional and starting? Sure. Um, so getting the business functional, um, I think, should it should be something that everybody feels like is a totally achievable um so so getting a business functional involved um applying through north carolina secretary of state to start a business it's a super simple form and then you get a number and then you use that number and your address to open a bank account and like that's all that's all you need to do um and it's, you know, then it's about, you know, all the other like website and marketing and getting to know people and creating the branding stuff. Um, but setting up a business is like really not hard. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that I would encourage everybody who ever sort of thinks about like, maybe I should start something just to explore it. Um, and <clears throat> because it's a way to, it's so basically what you need a business for is to handle money in a sort of a legal sort of sort of um, tax aware way. Um, and so it, I think it allows you to do a lot of things um, that isn't, it's not super hard. So it allows a lot of creativity and innovation um, without getting too bogged down in the sort of the ins and outs of the business itself. Um, I, I will say that having spent probably six years with a small architecture firm in Boston before coming to NC State gave me a sense of how a small design company works, um, where money comes from, how you write a proposal, um, how you think about billing. Um, and so, so some of the, some of the basic nuts and bolts around things like that, I think I'd already had in my back pocket from, uh, from working in architecture. Um, did I answer the question? Okay. Is that, okay. Um, let me see another question. Um, someone who second guesses everything, works yourself into a hole. How do I work to keep moving forward and not worrying about if I made the wrong decisions concerning profit or nonprofit? Um, so this is, I think this is something that I try to remember and try to remind uh, everybody on our team all the time of is that you will never make a perfect decision. Um, 
the I think the goal for at least the goal for me is to make a long series of good enough decisions. Um, and and so the kind of the second guessing things, um, I think that really starts to come up if um, if you're striving for perfection. Um, and I think Community Food Lab right now is set up as a good enough structure that allows us to do a lot of things. Um, so, so I think I, I try not to spend too much time second guessing things. Um, I think for me, I'll be honest, where I get most, um, um, I don't know, kind of, uh, kind of self, like self involved and sort of, uh, kind of down on where we are and where we're going is when I try to either engage in ideas of racial equity or reflect on kind of my own sort of performance or abilities around issues of racial equity. Um, I think I know enough, which is not much, I know enough about racial equity to know that um, I'm not, not good at it. Um, there's so much space to be a better um, advocate for communities of color, um, especially black communities, a better um, collaborator and supporter. Um, and I think, you know, walking through the world as a white man, I think there are a lot of things that you know, still unconsciously take for granted. And so for me, the business stuff is is kind of easy and working effectively um, with kind of low income and marginalized and communities of color, um, that's where I think I have the most, I guess like kind of emotional sort of second guessing or anxiety or worry about what my impact is and whether I'm making a difference or whether I'm causing damage by being there. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. It's really less about social enterprise and more about sort of racial equity in the food system and food justice, but, um, it's, you know, it's all kind of wrapped up together. So um, I'll leave right, that right there. If that sparks converse, questions for anybody else, throw them in the chat. Um, um, so I mentioned earlier, so another question, um, I mentioned earlier about having client-based solutions. Um, what does the company do to center communities and their needs in your projects and solutions? Oh, so actually a related question. How do you get into these communities or neighborhoods to collaborate? Um, so in, let me see, in the best cases, we work, um, with partners who are already in working, working with those communities or of those communities. Um, and so, um, when, when that happens, uh, we're in a really great situation. We can be, we can be the leaders of kind of a process, like how we get from A to B, um, but we don't have to bring the knowledge of what should be in a place. So, um, so when we're able to work with a client or a partner who, um, you know, either maybe it's a nonprofit that's based in a low income community or um, in the case of the project in Kenya, um, you know, our partner there was um, was a Kenyan sort of educator and, and sort of food systems advocate. And so we were able to work um, in those situations, we we're able to work with a person or a group of that community and we're able to sort of go hand in hand and we can help say this is this is where we should start and this is the kind of information we need to try to gather and then this is how we can work through it and then this is what we expect to come out the other end and we can talk about that and make sure that what we produce actually matches up and will be valuable. Um, the way we ask questions of people and participants in that community makes sense and will um, will be positive and productive. Um, so, so best case scenario, we are kind of being led by um, by a partner who's of that community and they can help us um, kind of tailor what we do in ways that are 
um, respectful and appropriate um, that still get to new ideas and hopefully innovations and creativity? Um, it's a it's a great question. Um, and in cases where we don't have um, sort of established connections in sort of in communities like that, communities that I don't sort of identify with, um, it's uh, critical for us to find um, sort of gatekeepers almost, kind of influential folks in those neighborhoods, um, trusted organizations, and get to know them and not assume that the community all trusts them because every community is complicated and there can be histories and relationships that we may not be aware of. And so when we start working with the community, we try really hard to not, um, to not assume that everybody feels the same way about every leader that community might have, uh, might sort of have standing out in front of it. Um, so, um, there's like in any, any, any situation like that, there's a lot of humility. Um, and there's also a lot of recognition that, um, you can actually be, you can actually cause damage by coming to a community and, um, either extracting time or information and not giving back or setting up dynamics that lead to distrust, um, and we, we try really hard to listen as much as possible and, um, and move slowly. Um, and also know that if we, you know, if we feel like we um, are moving in the wrong, wrong direction or if we're the wrong people for a project, we have to be able to say, we're not right for this project. Um, and I think that's, um, that's something that we've had to do before. It can be really hard, um, but, um, I think it, I think it's something that is really important when working with something as valuable and fragile as a community's sort of, uh, self-determination and empowerment in the future. So, um, again, you know, anyway, talking about it is a lot easier than doing it. Um, so, um, uh, great question. Thank you. And then a link to the um, farmers market study that we did, the presentation. Thanks, Mar Lowry does great work. If you um, if you don't know her, you should get to know her. Um, um, and then what facets of our business make it a for profit rather than non profit? Is this my only day to day job? Um, and where do you see the business in five years? Wow, great. Um, so <clears throat> our business is a for profit because we are um, incorporated legally as an LLC. So an LLC is a limited liability corporation. Um, and we file taxes based on that, um, which means that all of the money that comes in is, is income. Um, and, um, other, and so that sort of, sort of legally, I think other, there are lots of other for-profit structures, um, different kinds of corporations. Um, those are for profit and then nonprofit. Um, one you've probably heard of is a 501c3. There are other designations, um, but a nonprofit structure um, just changes the way that you get taxed, it changes the way that you have to um, register your leadership, um, and there's just different, different laws around it. Um, and so, so that's really, and then, so that's the way we're structured. And then the other facets that make us a for-profit are that um, at this point, at least all of our income comes through um, business activity. Uh, we sell our services through contracts as a, as a designer and consultant. Um, and so that in itself makes us a for-profit also. Um, we haven't made a lot of profit. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't want there to be any mistake. This is not, it's not a lucrative business. Um, I'm able to pay people fair wages, um, but I, I don't make very much. I've, I'm really lucky to have my, a wife that makes, um, makes a great salary and she's got benefits. Um, I'll just go ahead and throw that out there that unless your overall kind of financial picture um, uh, allows you to do this and allows you the flexibility to do this, it's pretty hard. Um, and so in a sense, my ability to run community food lab has been subsidized by 
my wife's good job and benefits for our family. So I'll just be straight up about that. Um, is this my only day-to-day -day job? It is. Um, I volunteer with the community food with the, I'm sorry, with the Capital Area Food Network. Um, but right now, Community Food Lab is my only day-to-day -day job. Um, and where do I see the business in five years? Um, really the tough question. Um, I think it, I think there's a couple different um, sort of scenarios. I think in one scenario, um, it sort of stays structured the way it is and it grows. And ideally for me, Community Food Lab would be about six people. Um, we'd have one or two large projects at a time, projects that take, you know, eight to 12 months each. Um, and then we'd have smaller projects kind of scattered across the country, um, lots of collaborations. Um, and so I think that would be a great size. I think it would allow for a lot of creative, creative overlap and energy. Um, another scenario for Community Food Lab is that it um, not only like grows, but also changes ownership structure. I think ideally Community Food Lab would be owner, would be employee owned. I think it'd be a much more flat kind of ownership structure. Um, and, and I would be able to step away from like the sole like boss of Community Food Lab and actually have Community Food Lab be um, a more, much more kind of uh, democratic kind of socially oriented sort of business itself as it's structured. Um, I think another option um, would be that Community Food Lab finds a sort of finds an institutional home and sort of moves to a place like NC State, for instance, and becomes sort of a design and research sort of food think tank kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of different ways it could go. Um, and um, I don't know, I think that, I think that's kind of the sort of double-edged sword of Community Food Lab is that it sort of, it does everything. It kind of knows how to be impactful, but it doesn't, Community Food Lab still, I think doesn't really know what it is. Um, it's just, it is kind of all over the place and, and it's fun, like day to day, it's really fun and exciting and there's new things all the time, but um, it's, it's hard to like know like exactly what we are. <laughs> Um, so, um, so I hope I answered everybody's questions. All right. I know it's about five, so I want to let LP jump in with, um, anything else. Oh, awesome. Thank you so, so much, Aaron. Um, and Gracie has, uh, put a link to our Kiss the Ground documentary screening in the chat. So I encourage those of you here to check that out. And we've got some great events tomorrow as well. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Aaron. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Congratulations to the symposium. Hope the rest of it goes well. Um, thank you. And everybody enjoy the springtime. You too. I learned so much. Like, <laughs> I, I do not understand, like, how businesses versus nonprofits and all of that worked. So that was very informative awesome. for me. Awesome. Yeah. It's the kind of stuff that I wish I had a, at least some, some handle on kind of when I was getting out of my undergrad, I think it just, uh, there's so much of the world that kind of that works through those frameworks. Um, and it just is helpful to know how the world works. You know, so that as you're making decisions about your place in it and your pathway, um, you're able to think, you're able to sort of have a better informed um, decision framework about what's right for you. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so, so much again. Cool. Um, absolutely. Again. Yeah, thanks for inviting me and thanks for uh, uh, engage, getting Mara engaged also. Um, so. Oh my